This is Susan Bassey, and perhaps it is the cop watcher in me that made me pull out my phone and record five police officers coming into a Starbucks shortly after the CEO announced that they might have to close their open bathroom policy. That was a policy that Starbucks set and had a right to set, but the question of whether or not they were entitled to have five police officers come and monitor something in their private business is an entirely different question. Can you back up, please? Sure. Thank you. You know, the Starbucks uh, CEO just announced that he was no longer going to have an open bathroom policy, and then I saw this, so it's kind of newsworthy. They still want you to come back, okay? Sorry, buddy, they just don't want to be there. That's, right. That's their choice in life, right? So, okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you, sir, for your help, okay? Thank you. All right. You got to go ahead and take off. Thank you. And just as any other investigative reporter would do, I called Starbucks and their press office to ask if they had any comment. They didn't return my calls. I also called the Campbell Police Department, where the chief makes nearly $500,000 a year, and I was given a sergeant who makes just over $200,000 a year. The sergeant told me that he believed the police officers responded professionally and according to their training. I told him that wasn't why I was calling. I was calling because I thought five police officers responding to a excessive bathroom time for a private business seemed like an excessive use of police officer resources and a waste of taxpayer dollars. He told me that no taxpayer dollars had been used in that incident because all of the police officers were already at work and not responding to other calls. I pointed out to him that if the police officers were dealing with the bathroom incident at Starbucks, they couldn't be doing community policing elsewhere and they wouldn't be available to enforce traffic enforcement laws, nor would they be available to help other businesses or residents who might need them as they were being paid for by taxpayers. Arguably, Starbucks is a private business that has a right to set policies related to their workers and their customers because they serve the public. They don't have a right to private oversight over public law enforcement agencies, nor do they have a right to violate the civil rights of customers or their workers. And this brings us an excellent opportunity to talk about private judging, because just as we have oversight over these police officers in this private business, we have oversight over attorneys who act as private judges in family law matters. And that's what we've been investigating. So when I went out to the beach where I had first encountered Capitola Karen, I decided that it was time to use the beach to start trying to explain private judging and how it works with government oversight. Think about a public beach like you would think about a public courthouse. We all have a right to use it, and we all understand that there are rules to keep us safe. Then imagine part of the public beach gets moved into private because someone is able to pay for it. And so everything that happens on that private beach 
still is subject to federal and state laws. And when two parties agree that an attorney, a retired judge, or any party for that matter, can act as their judge in a legal proceeding, the case moves from the public courthouse to a private area. But the public still has a right to oversee what's going on in that case, because the orders that are issued have to follow the law, have to protect the litigants, and have the full weight and authority of any order issued by a public court judge. Just as the public has a right to oversee what goes on on public beaches, we have a right to see what goes on in public courthouses with public court judges. And for that reason, public court judges must disclose all of their financial interests. Their dockets are a matter of public oversight, as are every single pleading that is held before them. We have a right to see every public court file, including files that indicate when a case is moved before a private judge. We have a right to monitor those dockets as well. But after five years of searching, we have found that in California, these dockets are not being posted, and the private judges are being secreted from the public, as are their financial conflicts of interest that may impact how they issue their rulings and their orders. Imagine for a moment that the attorneys acting as private judges are a small cluster of seaweed on the bigger public beach. Those private judges have an obligation to disclose their conflicts, to post their dockets, and to notice their hearings. But if they don't do that, then they alter the public and legal proceedings, and they cover up what can clearly be seen as public corruption. The most important aspect of private judging is making sure that the judge who is selected and afforded immunity acts fairly. And in order to do so, we need to make sure that that private judge discloses all of their conflicts. Conflicts that they may have with a party or some financial interest that they may have that may bias them to make rulings that carry the full weight of law and that are corrupted because of that bias or financial interest. And such disclosures are critical in our public servants, including our duly elected district attorneys and our judges, because when they don't disclose their financial relationships, it stands to hold for public corruption. Can we talk about that, or we're going to just use public I, resources? I think we have a private conversation. So. You're in a public space, Mr. Rosen. You should know there are no private conversations in a public space. What did you say? I just said he's directing. Oh, okay. Thanks. Are you Mrs. Rosen? Amber Rosen is also Judge Rosen. She has been appointed to the bench in Santa Clara County where she has presided over family law matters since 2018. Those cases involve juvenile dependency cases, CPS, and adoption cases. Her husband, Jeff Rosen, would have oversight as to any criminal conduct that she may engage in as a public court judge. He is the duly elected district attorney, and he is known for not making proper disclosures in cases where he is criminally prosecuting individuals, and he may have a financial interest in doing so. So these two are more deserving of public oversight than any other married couple in Silicon Valley, because these two individuals have the power and ability to impact family law cases, civil cases, and criminal cases. And they don't clearly seem to understand the law about public oversight and what the public has a right to know about how they are doing their jobs. You haven't done anything at all, at all, about private judging. And you are friends with these people, and you know Catherine Gallagher, is doing the worst harm in this community with private judging in secret. And what you and Jim Towery did to Judge Persky is shameful. You got him recalled to get Cindy Hendrickson on the bench. I have the emails, 573 of them, Mr. Rosen. And you think that keeping the public safe is what you're doing? You lied to the court, Mr. Rosen. You omitted the material fact that I'm a journalist. You lied to the court. That's Business and Professions Code 6128. It's a misdemeanor. You have committed a crime. Your wife let you drive the car today? Very brave of you to come without your wife today or police escort, Mr. Rosen. Very, very brave.
There he goes, this time having to drive himself. There goes the Santa Clara County District Attorney, Jeff Rose. People pay a private judge instead of having a judge used who is appointed by a governor or elected by the voters. And in paying the private judge, the parties still are subject to all the state and federal laws that apply to everybody and that protect all of our civil rights and the laws and the rules that come from our courthouses.